Mr. Flory, the surgeon was a bachelor. He had a large house high up by Santa Maria's and with a broad, easy conscience of an unmarried man. He invited Dr. Matarat to stay whenever the Sophie should come in for stores or repairs, putting a room at his disposal for his baggage and his collections, a room that already housed the hortosicus that Mr. Cleghorn, surgeon major to the garrison for clothes on thirty years, had gathered in countless dusty volumes. It was an enchanting house for meditation, backing on the very top of Mahan's cliff and overhanging the merchant's quay at a dizzy height, so high that the noise and business of the harbor was impersonal, no more than an accompaniment to, to thought. Stephen's room was at the back, on his cool northern side looking over the water. And he sat there just inside the open window with his feet in a basin of water riding his diary while the, the swift's common pallid and alpine raced shriekingly through the torrid, quivering air between him and the Sophie, a toy-like object far down on the other side of the harbor, tied up to the victualling wharf. So James Dillon is a Catholic. He wrote in his min minute and secret shorthand. He used, he used not to be. That is to say, he was not a Catholic in the sense that it would have made any marked difference to his behavior or have rendered the taking of an oath intolerably painful. He was not in any way a religious man. Has there been some convert conversion, some Loyolan change? I hope not. How many crypto-Catholics are there in the service? I should like to ask him, but that would be indiscreet. I, I remember Colonel Despard's telling him that an English England Bishop Challoner gave a dozen dispensations a year for the occasional taking of the sacrament according to the Anglican rite. Colonel T of the Gordon Riots was a Catholic. Did Despard's remark refer only to the army? I, I never thought to ask him at the time. Where is this the cause for James Dillon's agitated state of mind? Yes, I think so. Some strong pressures, certainly at what at uh, at work. But as more, it appears to me that this is a critical time for him, a, a lesser a cli climacteric, a, a time that will settle him in that particular course. He will never leave again, but he will persevere in for the rest of his life. It has often seemed to me that towards this period in which we all three lie more, more or less, men strike out their permanent characters or move less, move those characters struck into them. Merriment, roaring high spirits before this, then some chance con concoctination or some hidden predilection or rather inherent bias working through and the man is in the road he cannot leave but must go on, making it deeper and deeper a groove or channel until he is lost in his mere character, persona, no longer human, but an accretion of qualities belonging to this character. James Dillon was a delightful being. Now he is closing in. It is odd, will I say heartbreaking, how cheerfulness goes. Gaiety of mind, nature, free springing joy, authority is, is its great, great enemy, the assumption of authority. I know few men over 50 that seem to me entirely human, virtually none of none who has long exercised authority the senior post captains here admiral warren shriveled men shriveled in essence not a lass in belly pomp on unwholesome diet a cause of choler a, a pleasure paid too late and, a, and at too high a price like lying with a peppered paramour yet lieutenant nelson by jack aubrey's account is as direct and unaffected an amiable man as he could be wi wished so indeed, in most ways, is J.A. himself, though a certain careless arrogancy of power appears at times. His cheerfulness at all events is with him still. How long will it last? What woman, political cause, disappointment, wound, disease, untoward child, defeat, what strange, surprising accident will take it all away? But I am concerned for James Dillon. He is as mercurial as ever. He was more so only now. Is all ten octaves lower down and a darker key. And sometimes I'm afraid in a black humor he will do himself a mischief. I will give so much to bring him cordially friends with Jack Aubrey. They are so alike in so many ways, and James is. James is made for friendship. 
When he sees that he is mistaken about J.A.'s conduct, surely he will come round. But will he ever find this out? Or is J.A. to be the focus of his discontent? If so, there is little hope. For the discontent, the inner contest must at times be very severe in a man so humorless on occasion and so very exigent upon the point of honor. He's obliged to reconcile the irreconcilable more often than most men, and he is less qualified to do so. And whatever he may say, he knows as well as I do that he is in danger of a horrible confrontation. Suppose it had been he who took t wolf tone and laugh, swilly. What if Emmet persuades the French to invade again? And what if Bonaparte makes friends with the Pope? It is not impossible. But on the other hand, J.D. is a mercurial creature, and if once, on the upward rise, he comes to love J.A. as he should, he will not change. Never was a more loyal affection. I would give a great deal to bring them friends. He sighed and put down his pen. He put it down upon the cover of a jar in which there lay one of the finest asps he had ever seen thick, venomous, snub nose coiled down in spirits of wine with its split-pupiled eye looking at him through the glass. This asp was one of the fruits of the days that spent in Mahan before the Sophie came in. A third prize at her tail, a fair-sized Spanish tartan, and next to the asp lay. Lay two visible results of the Sophie's activity, a watch and a telescope. The watch pointed at 20 minutes to the hour. So he picked up the telescope and folks focused it upon the sloop. Jack was still bored, conspicuous in his best uniform, fussing amidships with Dylan and the bosun over some point of the upper rigging. They were all pointing upwards and inclining their persons from side to side in ludicrous unison. Leaning forward against the rail of the little balcony, he trained his glass along the quay towards the head of the harbor. Almost at once, he saw the familiar scarlet face of George Pierce, ordinary seaman thrown back skywards in an ecstasy of mirth. There was a little group of his shipmates with him, along by the huddle of one-storied wine shops that stretched out towards the tanneries, and they were passing their time at playing ducks and drakes on the still water. These men belonged to the two prize crews, and they had been allowed to stay ashore, whereas the other Sof Sophies were still aboard. Both had shared in the first distribution of prize money, however, and looking with closer attention at the silvery gleam of the skipping missiles and at the frenzied diving of the little naked boys out in the noisome shallows, Stephen saw that they were getting rid of their wealth in the most compendious manner known to man. No boat was putting off from the Sophie, and in his glass he saw the coxswain nursing Jack's fiddle case with stiff, conscious dignity. He leaned back, took one foot out of the water, tepid now he gazed at it for a while, musing upon the comparative anatomy of the lower members and the higher mammals and horses and apes in the pongo of the African travelers or Monsieur de Buffon's jocko, sportive and gregarious youth sullen, morose, and withdrawn in age, which was the true state of the Pongo. Who am I, he thought, to affirm that the gay young ape is not merely the chrysalis, as it were, the pupa of the grim old solitary, that the second state is not the natural, inevitable culmination, the Pongo's true condition, alas. I was contemplating on the prong Pongo. He said aloud as the door opened and Jack walked in with a look of eager expectation, carrying a roll of music. I'm sure you were, cried Jack. A damned creditable thing to be contemplating on, too. Now be a good fellow and take your other foot out of that basin. Why on earth did you put it in? And pull on your stockings, I beg. We have not a moment to lose. No, not blue stockings. We are going on to Mrs. Hart's party, to, to her rout. Must I put on silk stockings? Certainly you must. 
certainly you must put on silk stockings and do show a leg, my dear chap. We shall be late without you spread a little more canvas. You were always in such a hurry, said Stephen peevishly. Groping among his possessions, a Montpellier snake glided out with a dry rustling sound and traversed the room in a series of extraordinarily elegant curves. Its head held up some 18 inches above the ground. Oh, 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 cried Jack, leaping onto a chair. Snake! Will these do? Uh, Stephen, they have a hole in them. Is it poisonous? Extremely so. I dare say it will attack you directly. I have very little doubt of it. Was I, t was I to put the silk stockings over my worsted stocking? Sure, the hole would not show, but then I should stifle with heat. Do not you find it uncommonly hot? Oh, it must be two fathoms long. Tell me, is it really poisonous on your oath now? If you thrust your hand down its throat as far as its back teeth, you may meet a little venom. But not otherwise wise. But not otherwise. Mel Pollen. Mos Porcelanus is a very innocent serpent. I think of, uh, of carrying a dozen aboard for the rats. Ah, uh -huh. if only I had more time, if it were not for this foolish, liberal persecution of reptiles. What a pitiful figure you do cut upon that chair, to be sure. Barney, Barney, Buck or Doe has kept me out of Channel Row. He sang to the serpent, and death is an adder, though it was. He looked happily into his face while he carried it away. The first visit was to Mr. Brown's of the dark dockyard, where after greetings, introductions, and congratulations upon Jack's good fortune, they played Mozart B-flat quartet, hunting it along with great industry and goodwill, mis misplaying a sweet tone, the weak viola. They had never played all, all together before, had never rehearsed this particular work, and the resulting sound was ragged in the extreme. But they took immense pleasure there in the heart of it, and their audience, Mrs. Brown and the white cat, sat mildly knitting, perfectly satisfied with the performance. Jack was in tearing high spirits, but his great respect for music kept him in order throughout the quartet, it was during the collation that followed a pair of fowls, a glazed tongue, syllabub, flummery, and maids of honor, that he began to break out. Being thirsty, he drank off two or three glasses of celery without noticing them. And presently his face grew redder and even more cheerful, his voice more decidedly masculine, and his laughter more frequent. He gave them a highly colored account of Stephen's having sawn the gunner's head off and fixed it on again. Better than before, and from time to time his bright blue eye wandered toward Mrs. Bosom, which the fashion of that year, magnified by the distance from Paris, had covered with no more than a very, very little piece of gauze. Stephen emerged from his reverie to see Mrs. Brown looking grave, Miss looking demurely down at her plate, and, Mrs. and Mr. Brown who had also drunk a good deal starting on a story that could not possibly come to good. Mrs. Brown made great allowances for officers who had been long at sea, particularly those who had come in from a successful cruise and were disposed to be merry. But she made less up for her husband, and she knew this old story of old as well as the somewhat glassy look. Come, my dear, she said to her daughter, I think we will leave the gentleman now. Molly Hart's rout was a big miscellaneous affair with nearly all the officers, ecclesiastics, civilians, merchants, and Minorcan not notables, so many of them that she had a great awning spread over Signor Martinez's patio to hold all her guests, while the military band from Fort St. Philip played to them from what was ordinarily the commandant's office. Allow me to name my friend, my particular friend. And surgeon, Dr. Matarin, said Jack. Leading Stephen up to their hostess, Mrs. Hart. Your servant, ma'am, said Stephen, making, making a leg. I'm very happy to see you here, sir, said Mrs. Hart, instantly prepared to dislike him very much indeed. Dr. Matarin, Captain Hart, went on Jack. Happy, said Captain Hart, disliking him already. But for an entirely opposite reason, looking over Stephen's head and holding out two fingers only a little way in front of his sagging belly, 
Stephen looked deliberately at them, left them dangling there, and silently moved his head in a bow whose civil insolence so exactly matched his welcome that Molly Hart said to herself, I shall like that man. They went on to leave room for others. For the tide was flowing fast. The sea officers all appeared within seconds of the appointed time. Here's lucky Jack Aubrey, cried Bennett of the Aurora. Upon my words, you young fellows do pretty well for yourselves. I could hardly get into Mahon for the number of your Ackham captures. I wish you joy of them in course, but you must leave something for us old codgers to retire upon, eh? Eh? Why, sir, said Jack, laughing and going redder still. It is only beginner's luck. It will soon be out, I am sure, and then we shall be sucking our thumbs again. There were half a dozen sea officers around him, contemporaries and seniors. They all congratulated him, some sadly, some a little enviously, but all with that direct goodwill Stephen had noticed so often in the Navy. And as they drifted off in a body towards a table with three enormous punch bowls with a, and a regiment of glasses upon it, Jack told them in an uninhibited wealth of sea jargon exactly how each chase had behaved. They listened silently, with keen attention, nodding their heads at certain points and partially closing their eyes. And Stephen observed to himself that at some levels complete communication between men was possible. After this, both he and his attention wandered. Holding a, a glass of Eric Punch, he took up his stand next to an orange tree, and he stood looking quite happy, gazing now at the uniforms on, on the one hand and now through the orange tree on the other where there were sofas and low chairs with women sitting in them, hoping that men would bring them ices and sorbets, and hoping, as far as the sailors on his left were concerned, in vain. They sighed patiently and hoped that their husbands, brothers, fathers, lovers would not get too drunk. And above all, that none of them would grow quarrelsome. Time passed. An eddy in the party's slow rotary current brought Jack's group nearer the orange tree. And Stephen heard him say, They're a hellish great sea running tonight. It's, it's all very well, Aubrey, said a post-captain almost immediately afterward.